In our scripture reading this morning is also from the gospel according to Luke in chapter 9. We'll be looking once more, a last time at this event where three different people encounter with the Lord Jesus and they consider following him. We'll look mainly this morning at the very last encounter, the last two verses. So Luke 9 verse 57 and we'll read to the end of the chapter. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Thus far, in God's precious and holy word. And before we come um, to the Lord in prayer, we'll... Amen. I invite you now to turn to God's word in the gospel again, according to Luke chapter 9. And we'll be looking, as I mentioned, especially as to this third encounter um, that the Lord Jesus has on his way to Jerusalem. Um, In the first encounter, the man says, I will follow thee. In the second encounter, Jesus commands the man to follow him. And in the third encounter, again, is someone in his own disposition saying, I will follow thee. There's an importance even in that. So I'll read verses 61 and 62 of Luke 9. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. Of God. So, in this third encounter, as I said, the man is volunteering to follow the Lord Jesus, but he has an agenda that precedes the following. And the Lord Jesus answers with this um, figure before us. And so, I'll start by having this figure before us in a very vivid way. Um, in the in the days. Uh, that Jesus spoke this, it would immediately evoke in the minds of the people what, what in many ways would still today, there, there's some of us that are farther away from, from the agricultural world, and when you think of a plow, you'll think of a tractor, and you'll think of a big equipment, but in that day, it would be one plow that would be making one furrow, and it would have handles, and you would be seeing the very line that you were um, cutting and based on the next line and you would try to keep that straight and right in front of you would be a beast of burden that would be driving the plow and you would of course be having the whole field ahead of you and the way that they would make the line straight is that they would start where they have a fixed um, object in front of them something of course that wouldn't waver and, and would be still and they would keep that in their sight and they would do that first line that would be, in essence, absolutely straight if they kept their eyes straight. And then the following lines would all be based upon that last line. And so the whole field would follow a reasonably straight and metric and neat plot plowed. And, of course, the whole purpose of plowing is so that he can then go and sow the field. It was... It was preparing the soil. 
and putting the hands to the plow had the whole figure before um, our eyes and in their eyes of, of being ready to work and being ready to prepare and being ready to be at the business that is necessary, being ready to, 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 to do what will produce fruit, what will make other people happy, what will give other people life. And so we're speaking of productivity. We're speaking of doing something fruitful. We're speaking of doing something that is industrious and doing it well. And if, if you were to look back, so add that to the figure of what's before us, and, and the person who's there holding the plow, if he's looking back, you will not be able to do straight lines. You'll lose track of that fixed object. And then for the further lines, you'll lose track of that one line that you're supposed to follow. And so looking back will end up doing a bad work or even a stopping of the work. So there will not be productivity. There will not be industriousness. There will not be a field prepared. There will not be a seed sown. People won't be joyful and nourished and happy because of a harvest. And so this is clearly all, all of the images and all that Jesus is meaning. When that man says simply that request of, sure, I'll follow thee, but first let me bid those in my home farewell. And so this is, this is what's before us. Now, just as a review, when we looked at the three events, we came up with seven principles that, that are derived from the passage and other places in Scripture of what is involved in following Jesus, what is involved in discipleship. And just to draw them all out, because today's sermon is kind of based on on still those principles. Well, the first encounter, we, we find the principle that following Jesus involves sacrifice. Um, that man who said that, that he would follow the Lord Jesus wherever he would go, Jesus wanted him to understand what it would mean. That, that even animals in this world may have a sense of comfort and where to sleep, but the Son of Man has not where to lie down his head. And, and so he wanted the man to count the cost. And discipleship requires that, that you understand what, what, it, what will be involved. Um, and, and the second principle was kind of building on this one. That means that following Jesus involves the truth. There, there, there should be, and Jesus, as, as the master evangelist, did not allow for any false advertisement. He told the truth. There will be sacrifice. There will be limitations. There, there will be things that are sad, and you need to be ready for it. And then the third principle, um, and, and we still find this in the passage in an element, and, and further in the rest of the gospel, it is true that we need to count the cost. It is true that that is the truth, and we need to expect it and not be um, thinking, oh, I didn't realize that being a Christian would involve all this suffering. What do I do now? Um, no, that is the truth, but there's this element that actually following Jesus involves having the most solid home possible. What good is, is a place to lay your head on this world that really will never continue as a world as we know it when the end times come? And, and Jesus hinted to this in the second encounter. He said, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So, so notice this in, in Jesus' words. You can imagine how some people could be a little confused, but the whole message is there. Yes, I don't have a place where to lay my head, but there is a kingdom that I belong to. And they, we're understanding he is the king. And so we're not trading um, the sacrifice of no place to lay our head as an existence eternally of suffering. No, it is a kingdom. It is a glorious existence. And we'll, we'll look more into that still today. The fourth principle is the element that following Jesus involves the element of urgency. Following Jesus involves urgency. That man who said, let me first bury my father. And Jesus said, well, let the dead bury their dead. And you come and preach the gospel. And you could tell that that man didn't have a sense of urgency. He felt like he could go and still take care of things. Most likely his father was still alive. And he was just using that as an excuse not to follow Jesus right now. 
And, and this is something very, very essential, very, very important. If in our Christianity, if in your Christianity, it doesn't involve a sense of urgency for your own soul and the soul of others, then something drastically wrong is happening. And I just want to put in this here because it's very important to be applying to our hearts. If you don't live Christianity with a sense of urgency, you will actually be harmful and deterring other people to understand Christianity aright. Because if you profess to be a believer, and, and, and part of your teaching is that there's a heaven and there is a hell, and people then understand, okay, you're a Christian, and what you're saying is there's a heaven and a hell, but I've been your friend for 20 years, and you've never shown any concern for my soul that it might go to hell based on your doctrine, and that there's such a glorious place as heaven as there is in your doctrine. So you don't care to warn me about hell, and you don't care to woo me to heaven. So either your Christianity is not true or you are heartless. And I don't want anything to do with that. This is the logical reality of when we are not urgent about these matters. And so with our friends and with our neighbors, we need, to, we need to, yes, teach them there's a heaven and a hell and show how much we yearn them to be with us in heaven and how dangerous is that place called hell. That they would sense then, okay, you do love me, and you do care. And if what you're saying is true, then I better know it. I better learn it. No sense of urgency. We become those who deter other people and who teach false things about God. Because he is a loving God. He is a caring father. He's so caring that he sent his son to this world. And the Lord Jesus is one of the men in the Bible that reveals more things of the reality of hell. So he, he was doing that, showing, I, I, I'm concerned about you. And I don't want you to go there. Look at the reality of this place. And then the Bible speaks of the glories of heaven. To put into our hearts like a, a childlike yearning, I want to be in heaven. And we find out it's through Christ. So, so that's the, the fourth principle about involving a sense of urgency. The fifth one was that following Jesus involves accepting his terms. It is not a matter of Jesus proposing and we counter propose. When we do that, we have it all wrong. That man who says, well, let me first do this. Jesus said, follow me. And he said, well, here's my proposal. Jesus was saying, no, 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 you don't have a proposal. You accept mine. That's what Christianity is. It's not a choice put to us. Um, it is an acceptance of Christ's commands. And then sixthly was that following Jesus involves our greatest love. This, at the end of the day, is what it means to, to um, follow Jesus. It means to look at this world and realize I, I, even the proper love that and affection will have for other people that we should, should never um, exceed our love for God. And we'll actually never love other people more if we don't love God most. And so following Jesus involves our greatest love for him. He is in first place. And then we come to the seventh point, which is what we'll talk about more today. Following Jesus involves not looking back. Not looking back. And regarding looking back with the theme, your hand on the plow, we, we will look at, first of all, um, looking back in a general way and then looking to Jesus as, as the counter to looking back. Um, because here was Jesus. Think of, think of the physical reality that was going on. Jesus was right there, supposedly right in front of him. And, and he said, I will follow thee. So this man had to be talking to Jesus and, of course, looking to Jesus. And he said, I will follow thee. But then he says, but first let me go bid farewell, which are at home at my house. And, and wherever that house was, he would have to turn his back on Jesus to go there. And even if the house was behind Jesus, he would still have to put Jesus to the side and go to that home. And see, there's this physical reality where, where for him to do this thing he wanted to do first, he'd have to turn behind, he'd have to turn his back on Jesus. And that's why it's looking back. He said, anyone who looks back, Jesus said, is not fit for the kingdom of God. 
So we're going to look at what is it to look back. And then we're going to see some examples in the Bible of who looked back. We will see then why should we never look back. And then how can we avoid looking back? And that question is what will take us to our last point. The second point about looking to Jesus so what is it to look back? In a, first, in a, in a general sense, and then specific ways. There are different ways that we may be tempted to look back. But looking back has one general quality to it. Um, looking back is always a way of regretting. It is a way of seeing what has, what, what's in the present and even what's in the future. And then looking what you had in the past. And you're kind of preferring that. So you see what you have in the present and what the future promises. And you start regretting because you start thinking that what you had in the past was better. Um, and so, of course, it's a whole matter of a disposition. It's somebody saying, am I really wanting to do this? It's interesting how the first account and the second go hand in hand. In the first account, Jesus is saying, count the cost. The birds have nests, but I don't have where to lay my head. And here's a man thinking, wow, if, if that's true, it's not really easy to follow Jesus. I don't think I want to. But I guess I will because it's the right thing. And see, what Jesus is doing is saying, I don't want you to follow me, even if you think it's hard to follow me. And you prefer the days that you didn't. I want you to count the cost because I want followers who know the truth. And I'm not hiding anything. There will be tribulation. But I want people to look at trib the tribulation. And I want them to prefer this tribulation. And prefer whatever suffering. And prefer whatever sacrifice than what lies in the past. Not that you would see all of the, you'll have to suffer and look at all the glories you had and the pleasures and say, I prefer all of that. And if you do, then you're not fit for the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is saying. And so it's all a matter of regretting. But then we could say there's a, there's a general reality that it is this regretting. It is preferring the past instead of the future. But um, there's, there's specific ways that you can be regretting. And let's look at some of these. So some people look back because they are avoiding persecution. They, they think in terms of safety. Well, here's the safety I have. As a non-believer, no one's coming after me. No one's going to bother me. No one's going to maybe talk bad about me. I'm not going to lose my job. There won't be those kinds of afflictions. But if I, if I follow Jesus, they will call me one of his. In my town, people who are branded Christians lose their jobs. They lose their homes. They might lose their, their freedom. I, I prefer the safety that I have. You see, that, that's how some people look back. They think in terms of the safety, and they feel it's safer to not follow Jesus. Um, they, in essence, believed what Jesus said, um, where he said that in this world you will have tribulation. They're, they're reading the Bible, maybe, and they're seeing, well, look what, look what happened to these men. Look what happened to Jeremiah, because he was a prophet. Look what happened to David, because he followed God. Look what happened to Paul and how he was persecuted. Look how Peter ended his life, if it's, if it's true what I'm reading about, about the tradition of what happened to Peter. And all of these apostles, all of them gave their lives for the Lord. And the only one we're not sure how he ended dying, it seemed like he died of old age, was John. But he's there in exile in the Isle of Patmos. And you're reading all of this and you're thinking, it's, it's dangerous to be a Christian. I might lose everything. And that's a price too dear. I might lose my friends and I could not do without them. I might lose my job and my position is too great to lose. I might be afraid of losing my own life. And that will be too costly. Jesus said that the fox have holes and the birds of the airs have nests. And the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. Um, I will be realistic. I want a place to lay my head. 
So there are many who do not follow Jesus today because they see what it costs to be a believer and they look back at their gain as a non-Christian and they prefer that life. Now, now one word, if, if that ever is anybody who may be listening to us with this kind of temptation of looking back, it's not true. See, this is why we said that principle. It is not true. You're not really losing. You're only gaining. Jesus was honest that, yes, in this life, you'll have tribulation. But what for the next? What for heaven? And, and think, of, think of the sad reality and how Satan blinds people to believe this, this false analogy. They think, if, uh, here I am, my home is secure as long as I don't tell people I'm a Christian. And if I am a Christian, I'll lose this home. Well, if that happens and they lose that home, it's only for a little while. And think of what Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, before he went to the cross. He said, in my father's house, home, in my father's home are many mansions. I am going to prepare you a place. And so if they can burn my house here on earth, if I identify with Christ as he's my Lord and Savior, that is a harm they can do upon this earth. But then I will be in heaven with a home that no harm can ever afflict. No fire can ever burn. And think of how true the opposite. If you end up loving your home and your safety more, and, and you want your friends, and you don't want them to, 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 to bother you if you're a Christian, you, you, you look back and you say, I want the safety. I don't want the persecution. So you'll, you'll have that safety, and you'll have those friends for a little while. But what will happen the day you die? What will happen the day Jesus returns? And you literally were ashamed of him. And you did not confess him. Jesus said that he would be ashamed of us. That is the greatest affliction. Because it's an eternal one. And so that for our first way of how some people look back. Another way that people look back is that they, they look at the pleasures of the world and they think, well, if I'm not a Christian, I can live this way and I can indulge in all these things and these are the pleasures I can have. If I follow a Christian, there are too many things to obey. Um, I will lose one day in seven. I, I will lose one dollar in every ten if, if I need to give my, my, my offerings. And if, if 10% is a gauge, I, I need to give $100 out of 1000 If I make $5,000, I'll have to give $500. And to some people's mind, literally, I, I've heard people say, how can I give $500 every month? They they look at their $5,000 that they can keep. And they think, if I become a Christian, I'll, I'll have to chip away from that and give it to offerings. And they, it, it, they're showing that they prefer the amount they can keep than that amount minus an offering amount. Lydia, I've, I've literally had a couple people come to me and say, how can a Christian exist giving offerings? Because my life, I can't see of any amount that I could give because I need it all. And there, there's a genuine concern. They've never done it. Um, they are living paycheck by paycheck. And, but see, it's really a reality. They're counting the cost. And they're literally saying it's too costly to be a Christian. In, in the case of offerings, it's in a very literal way. And in the case of pleasures... They think, this is all I could do as a Christian, but now, I mean, as a non-Christian, but now as a Christian, I, I, I can't do those things anymore. It, it's going to be too costly. And what could we say for those? Again, it's not true. Again, it's not true. Every single believer has found that following in the paths where we obey the Lord, however strict it may sound, one day in seven, 
See, our hearts, isn't it true, congregation, that, that our hearts are aching that we can have that one day in seven together. And even as we can't be together, we haven't all thought, well, now since I can't go to church, I'll just go to work and I'll go to the beach. No, we're, we're at home keeping the Lord's day. And, and we do this willingly. The Lord make us want to do it. And even everything else, well, okay, I can't have those relationships anymore and all of that immorality. Now, now I need to be pure, but I want to be pure. And I'm joyful being pure. I'm not with shackles to be pure. I had been in shackles in my immorality. That was a slavery. Now I'm, I'm being pure, and I can be pure. I want to be pure. And the Lord helps me in my purity. And in terms of offerings, we, we always hear from believers that, that they, they have seen how the Lord blesses them and how truly it happens when we give freely and generously and do not worry. The Lord blesses and helps us and strengthens us. And again, he makes us willingly do it. And we should never, ever, ever give one cent if we're not giving it with all our heart. If we give it begrudgingly, it's really not a gift anymore. And for all those who turn this doctrine around and say, yes, just give a lot and God will give you back. And then they're really just giving because they want. That's also not biblical giving. You're just getting and giving to yourself. No, we, need, we give it generously. We serve the Lord willingly. And so those who look back and say, well, the pleasures of this world are better than the pleasures of following Jesus. It is not true. Do not feed yourself those lies. And then there might be some also, there are some who look back because they are too academic, so they think, for Christianity. And it's also the same thing. See, they look back and they see the amounts of evidence for evolution and they consider them as facts and, and they, they've read the papers, they've read the critics and they've read the seculars and the atheists and then they've compared it with scripture and they've looked at its antiquity and they think, well, it's too old. They look at the miracles and say, no, these must be two wonderful things. And, and they put the scriptures and they put the things of the world and they look back and prefer them. And say, well, my mind is more attuned with these things of the world and science and not really with the Bible. And they consider it myth and they consider it not true. And that too, we could say the very same thing. It, it, it isn't true. You know, young men and women who go to college and then you start listening from the evolutionary classes that they try to say that it's, that, that there are a lot of facts, and it's simply not true. It's simply not true. Of all the millions of years that they claim this world have existed, there would have to, and with all the species of animals that there are, there would have to be by necessity millions and millions and millions of fossils of animals of every species turning into the next or in the sequence of doing that. In the, they, they claim that it would have been millions of years to go from one species to the next. So millions of years with no fossil evidence. We only have fossils of an animal that's truly a fish and an animal that's truly a, 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 a mammal. Where are the millions and millions of fossils from the millions and millions of years of each animal turning from one to the next? There's absolutely none. And the few fossils they say here and there that seem to be that, they, they find out later in further study that it is. And no, that's, that's really a bird and not a mammal. Now, that's not a fish. It's a reptile. There aren't those evidences. And, and, and there's a lot of lies. They make students believe there are those evidences. So all we need to do is some homework. And then... And then there's a scripture, and this is what I think is so wonderful. I, I wish we could go into a room, and the Bible Museum does a good job at that, at helping us understand how the thousands of manuscripts that have been preserved and have been put together for the Old Testament and the New, and how it's just majestic to think of the overwhelming evidence that these manuscripts, some come from hundreds of years of difference from the other and from different places that they were 
were transcribed and copied, and never they arrive at a different doctrine that defaces Christianity. Never. There is human error, as the scribes were copying. Sometimes it was an O, and they put a C as as an example. Sometimes a word is there that you don't find in certain manuscripts, which even testifies it wasn't computer work doing all of that. It was humans that were actually doing it. But in all of these mistakes of scribes, if you put them together, again, a majestic reality. Never a doctrine is defaced. You don't have manuscripts of Christianity that say Jesus is not God and then other manuscripts that say he is God. They all testify in a uniform way. And when you study all of that evidence, you realize uh, there's nothing to look back to. It is all falsehood. And all that I see in Christianity is what feeds an academic mind to realize this is truth. This is good. This is right. And so this is what's so sad is that looking back is is irregular. It is illogical. And, And why would I look back if I'm trying to do a straight plow? I'm only going to get confused. It's only going to bother the work. And yes, it's that temptation. I'd rather be out in the lake than plowing. And I'm looking to the lake or I'm looking to my friends. I'm looking to my treasures and not wanting to work hard. But when I find out that hands on the plow means looking to Christ to serve him, when we have that in our hearts, and we'll see this more in our second point in just a few minutes, then keeping our hands on the plow isn't so hard at all. Just a few examples of who has looked back. Because this helps us understand how, how serious, how damaging, how dangerous it is to look back. Um, in, in this first example, I thought um, every, to see how looking back has a, an effect of affecting others. Every single human minus the family of Noah looked back in the days of the flood. And think of how true this was. They were seeing everything. Some people think many of the, of the people were even employed in helping to, to build the ark. We're, we're not sure who all built it, literally, if there weren't others who at least helped build it. But they were all seeing this, this ark. They were understanding. It speaks of how Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was making it clear that there would be salvation no other way but through that boat, going through that door. Such a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the door, the only way and truth in life. And and for 120 years, that that was the gospel preached to them. And they were looking at that world that was terra firma, and they were looking at that ship that to them looked like a fantasy. It looked so unreal. It looked so silly. And, And you can imagine the people as they see the animals going in. And, and so there's that communication of come in with Noah or stay in this world. And literally, every single human looked back. They did not trust that to be a savior and the means of salvation. And they thought it was safer on that soil than now that boat full of animals and creatures. And so they stayed behind. And when the rain started to fall, the doors were closed. And there was no more way to look in the ark. They could look to it. And they saw it rise in the waters. Those who were in higher ground could see that now the safest place was that boat. See, this is exactly what we've been talking about. The person who wants the pleasures of the world thinks that that's more fun. But one day he'll see that he can't have that anymore. Those who think the riches of this world or the position is better, the safety of this world is better than being a Christian. I might lose my home. I might lose my reputation. But see, one day there will be this sight of the ark, as it were, floating and safe and the waters coming to drown us. That will be the day of judgment where the goats will be separated from the sheep. 
And so today is a day to realize that looking back is dangerous. All those people who look back, they stayed out of the ark and they died outside of the ark. And then another example, perhaps the example that, that came to mind to many who may be hearing this sermon, it's Lot's wife. And you'll remember, remember how the angels taking Lot's wife Lot's two daughters and Lot out of, out of Sodom, how the angels said not to look back. And Lot's wife did. And her looking back was, was typifying exactly this. To, 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 to go with these angels in, in the uncertain world of out there and losing my home and losing my livelihood, losing my family, my friends that stayed in, in that city is just too dear to me. She literally calculated the cost, and it was just too uncertain to follow Lot and those angels. And so she looked back, and the Lord caused her to die right there and then because the command was disobeyed, and she turned into a pillar of salt. But you see how not true it was. She, she was in the company of angels. The Lord was protecting her. Yes, there would be the afflictions. It's, it's the, the afflictions that Jesus promises, but there would be glory at the end. There would be a family united. They, they knew the promises given to Abraham. They could be connected to them. Lot was a converted person, we hear. So she had the gospel, and she could be in, in, in the glories of heaven forever. And that would be much better than a Sodom. That's not there anymore. You see? So these examples, and, and I just want to give this one real quick. Another example in the New Testament would be Demas. Demas was a servant of, of professed servant of the Lord Jesus. He was helping Paul. He was accompanying Paul. But in 1 Timothy, he is writing to Timothy, and he is sad and disillusioned. He's in prison. He's needing help, and he's asking Timothy do diligence to come shortly unto me. And then he explains why he needs Timothy. He says, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So clearly Demas looked back and saw, here's Paul in prison. Um, I have a home. I have a family. Things are going to get tough for me. I prefer to go back to that. And he did. And left Paul alone. And, and look at the reality. Demas' name, no one calls their children Demas. At least I've never heard of any. It's, it's a name connected to looking back. Just as Lot's wife in the Old Testament, Demas, having forsaken him, loving this present world. And look at Paul's name. He's honored as the greatest missionary this world has ever known. You see what looking back is? It's, 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 it's a false calculation. It's people who calculate the cost, which Jesus wants us to do, but then they find it's too hard to serve, so they prefer not to. So they actually lose instead of gain. So, so let me end with this in this point. You see what Jesus is desiring. He's wanting you to count the cost. He's wanting you to see that, yes, there will be affliction. But he wants you to realize, and I want this affliction. It doesn't matter the tribulation. Whatever will happen to me, even if I pay with my life dearly, I am in the right track. I have Christ as my Lord and Savior. So I'm losing nothing at the end that's really that really matters. And so this is why we end with this question. Why, how can you avoid looking back? What, what is the antidote to looking back? And we close with the second point, looking to Jesus. Um, remember I gave that little illustration that when you're, when you're doing that first line, of course, depending on what farm that is, there may be already a nice line of a, of a, of a of a fence, and so you're following that. But what keeps the line straight in, in a constant way is a constant point. It is a marker that is immovable, something that is constant. And this is precisely the picture here. If your eyes are set upon Jesus, his glory, his honor, you won't even be tempted to look back. 
Because you will see him. You will see who he is. You will see what he has achieved for you. You will see what reward you have because you have him. You will see the eternity that he promises. You you will see the sacrifices that he made here. And that will take your heart and it will make you have sympathy for what he did and value. And you want to honor him. You want to glorify him. And and there will be the temptations of the of the of the past and the and the glories and the heaven and the people and and and, and the friends and and slow as your heart are more, is more and more fixed upon Jesus, those temptations won't even be too great anymore. To the point where you're not even listening to them. They're, they're whispers now. And they're not too loud. And, 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 when they're, and, and for a believer that we, we do fail and we give that little glance back, but then we do realize, no, that, that is not what I want. There's no joy in that. There's no glory. Because we have God. And think of it. When you have Jesus, you have everything. Remember how Abraham, and we saw this, I believe it was just last Lord's Day. He was at a very critical time in his life. He, he was living through the roughness of this life. The road was rugged for him and Sarah. Um, there had been already famine and pilgrimages, and they were in a wilderness of sorts. And, and there were people mocking him because he had the promise of being the father of many nations, but he doesn't have even one son. And then he delivers Lot from that army and now there's a threat that those kings might come and assail him. And God comes to him and says, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So this is what Christ wants us to see. That, okay, I'm with my hands to the plow. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian now. There will be a lot of persecutions and afflictions, but I'm looking to Christ. And as long as Christ is my Lord, God is my Savior. And so you have God as your God. You have, you, you have him as your Savior. You have him as your Lord. You have him as your King. That means he'll protect you. He'll take care of you. He'll give you everything you need. And you have him as your Father in a loving and, and gracious way. And then, of course, if you have the Father, you have the Son. So you have Jesus as your shepherd. You have him as your master. You have him as your friend. You have him as your pastor. You have him as your elder brother. Everything he is. And then because you have the Son and the Father, he sends you the Spirit. And so you have the, you, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You have he who is the sanctifier. See, he's right there in you, making you desire to look straight and desire holiness. You have him who is the comforter, who is the counselor, who is the teacher and the guide. And then you have God the Son, God the Spirit, and God the Lord Jesus giving you everything that you need that is in their offices to do. You have reconciliation with the Father, forgiveness of your sins. You, you have the promise of his presence, the answer to prayer, the communion of saints. And you have the, 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 the joy and peace in your heart. And you have the, the gratitude for, for heaven. And you have the expectation of heaven. And to be there with him forever and ever and ever. And this, is, this is what we need to understand. There's nothing to look back to. This is why if you do look back, you're not fit. Because you're literally thinking there's more glory in everything earthly than in Christ. And this is why I wanted to just have this little panoply of Christ and the Father and the Spirit and what we have in, in them if you're a believer. So, dear believer, never be tempted to look back. If you're con considering Christianity, know then the truth that yes, there will be afflictions, but know this truth. They're, they're nothing compared to the glories of head and they're nothing compared to the eternal afflictions of the result of looking back that will be tribulation. And it will be eternal. It will be forever. Here, there's the fear of a house burning. 
I, I use this figure because you hear of churches burning and homes burning in places right now where there's persecution. But in hell there's burning forever. Here there is a danger of locking you in prison because you're a Christian and in this nation you cannot profess allegiance to Christ. But in hell it is a prison forever. You see, every affliction that can be done to a believer here on earth is nothing compared to the affliction that will be done in hell forever. So that there's no regretting. If you're a Christian, there's nothing to regret. It is all glorious. And may the Lord give this heart to each of us and, and add to these numbers, giving the faith that is necessary to then count the cost and not find it too costly. Let us then close in prayer. Our gracious and glorious God Almighty, we praise Thee for who Thou art. We praise Thee, Lord, for the glory and wonder that it is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that thou would cause our eyes to rise from this world. That Yes, it is a valley of tears. And yes, for the believer, especially in many countries and many times, there are many tribulations and more tribulations than, than for others. But Lord, help us not to be dissuaded by those tribulations and not to even be sorrowful in living the Christian life as it were a drudgery, but that we would... You realize, Lord, the glories and the wonder and the rewards. And Lord, to be used of Thee to plow the fields and, and to sow the seed and to see, Lord, through the power of the Spirit, those seeds growing and being, um, Lord, reflected in many who would hear the gospel and believe and be saved, them and their household, all, Lord, who, who they would now preach to and 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 attract to the Lord Jesus Christ with the message of the gospel. Lord, what a, what a glorious truth. How productive, how full of life, how full of continuation. What a, what a glory that never ends where, Lord, the opposite of looking back like a Demas and whose name is seen um, as so um, shameful. Lot's wife who doesn't even have a name. Those poor, miserable people who preferred their earth than that ark and perished. Lord, help us to see the great danger of looking back. Lord, that none of our young people who are contemplating the profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if they had temptations to this point to look back, Lord, that thy word would be used in a powerful way to give them a yearning and a desire to even more quickly than ever profess their faith in the Lord Jesus, depending on thee to strengthen them and to make them walk the walk of faith. We ask, Lord, all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.